Welcome to another podcast episode of DIY Guitar Making. I also produce video episodes of DIY Guitar Making live in the workshop. To find both the podcasts and the videos all in one place, go to DIYGuitarMaking.com. You can even subscribe to the email list there to receive new episodes, both the videos and the podcasts, directly in your inbox as they come out. Again, that's DIYGuitarMaking.com. And with that, let's get to the show. The following is a conversation with Jim Harris of the popular woodworking YouTube channel, Blasting Build. Among many other different projects that Jim has going on on his YouTube channel, Jim has a great series on building a treadle lathe, he has another series on building a chicken coop, and now he's starting a series on building an acoustic guitar, all within his woodworking channel, Blasting Build. To help him out with the acoustic guitar build, He's taking my online course, Building an OM Acoustic, and Jim will actually be returning to the podcast several times throughout his build in order to ask questions whenever they crop up. But for now, it's not going to be about him asking me questions in this episode. It's really going to be me asking him the questions. So Jim and I have a great conversation. We talk about treadle lathes we talk about building workbenches to fit specifically in your space we talk about uh, building jigs for guitar building we talk about locally sourced woods versus exotic imported woods and a whole bunch of other great topics if you want to see more about what jim does check him out on his youtube channel lasting build that's all one word or on twitter you can check out hashtag lasting build or you can always contact him at lastingbuild at gmail.com. And without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Jim Harris. I'm going to get into the acoustic guitar stuff a little bit later, but to start, I just want to hear about you as a general woodworker. I've watched a lot of your videos, and they're great, I've noticed you do a wide variety of projects. Some you might consider fine woodworking. Other ones would be more like homestead projects, like what a carpenter would do. So I guess my first question is, how do you see yourself fitting into the framework of either a fine woodworker or would you call yourself a maker? Or, you know, there's obviously some carpentry mixed in there. How do you define that? Well, I I think the way it started was, You know, I had been watching YouTube woodworking channels for a long time before I started my channel. And and I was wanting to to basically turn a empty garage into a wood shop. And and I started doing that before I before I started filming. And I was, you know, maybe six months or a year into that. I started thinking, well, maybe this would be interesting on YouTube. So that's what I did. I started filming and. And I've done a variety of, of projects, and really it's just um, whatever I'm interested in at the time. Like, for example, the first major project I did on the channel was a, I built a, a Paul Sellers carpenter's bench, hand tool work bench. And then that, I did that completely with hand tools. I didn't use any power tools at all. And part of that was I just wanted to learn how to use hand tools, and I wanted to be efficient with them. Right. And then that led to me building a hand tool treadle lathe. I'd always been interested in treadle lathe, treadle lathes and, and foot powered lathes. And that led me to do that. I did that with completely with hand tools and it's just kind of going from there. Um, over time, I think I've just kind of built whatever was of interest to me at the time and tried to make it uh, reasonably fun to watch on YouTube. I've always been interested in French cleats and shop organization. And that was really the first, the first video on my channel that really took off. And, and that led to a whole series on French cleats that I did. And, um, it's just kind of going from there. I, I wouldn't call myself a fine woodworker, but I certainly have an interest in 
um, traditional woodworking and mortise and tenon and joinery and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. that's sort of a uh, kind of how I've gotten started uh, as a hobbyist. Yes. So let's talk about that treadle lathe because I saw that build and that really jumped out at me more than anything else. That was just super cool. I don't have a lathe myself. I don't do any lathe work. I, I've never, uh, I've never done any lathe work, but I think part of the reason I've never touched a lathe is because quite frankly, they're pretty terrifying, you know, the powered version of a lathe, but I had never heard of a treadle lathe before. The concept is interesting to me because sometimes, for example, on my drum sander, I will unplug it and pull on the belt to manually turn the drum. Certain fine tasks, I will manually turn the drum in that way rather than running it with the motor because the motor is just too powerful. And the treadle lathe was interesting to me in that regard because it seemed like you can manage the the power of it manually with your feet so it really just takes a lot of the the diciness out of that machine is that uh sort of the idea behind a a treadle lathe or is it just a an old world way of doing that process yeah really i think um the treadle lathe came along before power tools as a way of turning wood even way back before even a treadle lathe was developed, there was the spring pole lathes where you have a stick or a limb that has some flexibility to it. And that actually powers the movement of the wood. Um, but that, if you can picture that in your head, as the limb goes up and down, there's a string tied to your to your workpiece. The piece of wood spinning is going in like it'll go forward, go back, forward backwards forward backwards where with a treadle lathe when you get it spinning you can either go forward or you can go backwards you can't do both like whatever way you get it going is the direction it's going to go and traditionally a lathe turns towards you so um, that's the way i normally use it but um to answer your question i think the lathe i think the treadle lathe was just a way of turning wood without power and um they there were some commercially made models available, you know, in the eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds. You can still find them sometimes on eBay, and they're exceedingly expensive. You're talking thousands of dollars for like a you know like a cast iron model. But um, I kind of designed it similar to a sewing machine, and um, it's got sort of the same functionality to it. You've got a a big flywheel. And then you've got a small uh, pulley at the top that turns the turns the workpiece, and I mean it's a real simple design, but it works pretty well. I can actually get get that workpiece turning like around twelve hundred to fourteen hundred RPM. Um, I mean you're going to work for it. Don't get me wrong; your leg's going to be tired <laughs> by the end of the day. Yeah, but yeah. But yeah, it, it it actually works pretty well. It surprisingly works pretty well, and and you could certainly use it for some sanding operations. And another use for it, I think, would be good in, in leather craft. You could use it for burnishing a leather. And that's something I may do in the future. Like if I make a leather strap for the guitar that I'm building, I may burnish it with a lathe. And all I have to do is just turn a piece with different uh, different shapes um, that I could use to, you know, to burnish the edges of the leather, which would be really neat. And that so- would work really well, I think. So how would you use that for sanding? What did you mean by that? Oh, well, you could just, you could make some different, uh, like sanding drums of, of different sizes and you could uh, wrap it in sandpaper and then and use mm. that to stand with. And so, so you fix that to the lathe, essentially. You, yeah, right? you could, you could just make some different work pieces. Wh- whatever um, you call the, what, what do you call the portion of the lathe that you fix the work piece to? I don't, I don't know the terminology. Well, you've got a, uh, you essentially have a uh, my I can't think of the name of it right at the right at the right now, but I mean you've you essentially got your workpiece affixed in two different spots on the lathe, and it's got some little prongs that fit into the wood, and then that that's what you know turns the wood. So you could just make a bunch of different blanks with sandpaper on it and stick it in there and mm. and turn it and make it uh, into an impromptu drum sander essentially 
Yeah, it, it would be without the table. You wouldn't have the the flat table to run things under. So it'd be a drum sander for the purpose of doing edges. It'd be kind of like a uh, a horizontal spindle sander. <laughs> right. You know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Much. Yeah. Yeah. Much, you, could, much... you could do some other things too. Like you could um, you could actually make a um, you could almost it, not really a belt sander, but you could make it into like a disc sander. There's a there's a, actually a disc sanding attachment you can attach to lathes, and you can build yourself a little um, a, a little area to put the, your chisel on or your, put your workpiece on, and then you can you can make it actually sand at ninety degrees. There's a lot of things you can do with it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I never really thought much about. Uh, like I said, I was, I've always been. Uh, well, I never had the need, and then also a little bit of intimidation with. Have you ever used or had a a power? You know, a regular modern lathe that you plug in i have not that's one of the reasons i built it i didn't really have the money to buy a nice lathe so i just built one mm, nice nice i mean i had all, i had all the lumber actually i built it out of oak and uh a friend of mine gave me the oak it was a tree that was down in his on his property and he had it milled up and he gave me a few pieces of it and that's what i built it out of there's a couple of pieces of cherry i used for some wedges and things and the whole the whole lathe is built out of mortise and tenon, and really like a timber frame style um, joinery, so it could actually all be taken apart. Did you have to do a lot of metal work to get that done? Uh, the only thing that required metal work was just for the like the pedal apparatus. You essentially got a crank mechanism, so I had to have um, two ninety degrees, two ninety degree uh, bends and a piece of metal and a piece of steel, like three quarter inch steel. Okay. Is that actually, something? I had, a, I had a local machine shop uh, help me with that because I couldn't get it hot enough to bend it just with a hand torch. So they uh, they helped me out. They had some equipment. We did that together. So yeah, is, is metal work a bit outside of the purview of your shop? Is that something you normally source out, or are you? I really don't. Do... I don't really have any metal working equipment. You know, and it's just not something I have an experience with. Yeah, I'm exactly the same way. So when, whenever I have to cut metal or um, braid metal or shape metal in any way, I if it's something small, I'll go ahead and tackle it in whatever way I can kind of jury rig something together. But other than that, it's something I, I have to go elsewhere for, you know, being primarily a wood shop as I am. So another sort of direction I want to go with this is, again, kind of jumping off from the treadle lathe is I've noticed you build a lot of the equipment and workbenches and things like that that could otherwise be purchased. And you buy some things, you know, obviously, like you didn't build your spindle sander, for example. Where do you see yourself as far as the, the difference between buying the tools and equipment you need and building them yourself? I think when it comes to workbenches and things, you have to design those for your space and, and what the type of work you do. Um, I, you know, I, certainly buying power tools and things, there is some of that. And, and I don't think there's a lot of options otherwise, unless you're going to do all hand tool work. But uh, I have right. built pretty much all of my, uh, I've got a workbench that is mounted to the wall in the back of my shop. I built that. And I built my hand tool workbench, and then I have a uh, outfeed table for my table saw that I also use for an assembly table that I built. And I also have a router table that I built. And I mean, I've been working on these things for a long time. I built that router table probably ten years ago, and then the workbench, the hand tool workbench, I built a couple years ago. But I think when it comes to workbenches and things, you kind of have to build those things and design them for your space and, and your workflow. Right. I'm not opposed to buying some power tools and, and whatever I need. And um, yeah, so I, I think when it comes to workbenches, you, you kind of got to, it's hard to buy workbenches and things that are made for your space. Yeah. So what is your space slash workflow situation like? Do you have uh a larger space or sort of a medium space or a small space where you have to, it sounds like it's a little bit smaller because you have to double task the outfeed table as a workbench, right? As an assembly bench. That's right. I, I'm a little under 400 square feet. 
I'm in the, I have a detached garage building. It's a two story building and I'll, my shop is in the bottom floor and it, uh, it comes out roughly to about 380 square foot. And because I've had so many interest in different type of woodworking projects, I'm not really set up for just one operation. I have a, a fairly you know, fa- fairly good amount of tools for a lot of different things, but I'm not really set up for one particular project or type of project. So it's pretty tight, I would say. You know, I think I think moving forward, I'm going to have to come up with some way to optimize the space or come up with a new space. So that's a good place to segue into the guitar build that you're really in the early stages of right now, correct? Where, where are you at right now? I have completed the sound. Well, I've got the sound box closed and I'm ready to uh, go ahead and work on bringing the edges down flush with the sides. And then I can start working on the binding and the purfling. And then I've also got the neck. I've got the scarf joint glued together and I've got the heel block glued together. And I'm ready to go ahead and start working on the, uh, the truss rod slot and shaping the neck and everything, the fretboard. Oh, so I'm moving, I'm moving along pretty well, but I have realized that, you know, before I, before I started building the guitar, I went ahead and I, I went ahead and built some jigs and things to get me going. I had built a table to, or a sort of a, uh, I had built a, a thing for uh, gluing up the, the, the back and the soundboard. I built a, a joining board or a shooting board and, I had built the go bar deck and I had some of those things done to get me going. But now I've realized I'm going to have to build some more jigs for the yeah. neck and, and everything. So the I'm jigs kinda just a, keep coming. I'm kind of at a place where it's going to get a bit slower because I've got to build some more jigs. And yeah, can, can you speak a little bit just to the uh, amount of time that just jig building? Well, so takes? I'll, I'll back up a little bit. You know, I, I started, so I took your class, I took your online class, and that's how I learned to build a guitar. And I started your class back in, uh, I don't know, maybe March, February or March. And and I went through your whole class and kind of just breezed through it to kind of get an idea of the tools I needed and the jigs I needed. Mm-hmm. And that, that I sort of started working on um, throughout the summer. And it did. It took me. It took me a, a little while to get um, the go bar deck put together, or assembled uh, uh, to get the shooting board built and get and get uh, a glue up station for the for the back and the and the sound board. And you know, it probably took me a couple weeks to get those things kind of set up and get them to get them built. And then and then I moved on to the guitar mold, which took me probably ten days to two weeks to get it right. I just I didn't want to, I really wanted it to be, um, to be as perfect as I could get it. And I also wanted it to be quality enough that it could be used for future builds as well. And so, so you've adapted your workspace. I have uh, sort of, uh, now. I sort of have a stack of jigs in the corner. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and they're yeah. sort of encroaching on my foot space. Uh, now I need to build about four or five more jigs and I have no idea where I'm going to put them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, space is definitely an issue, especially if you're doing the go bar method. That's correct. That it definitely takes up a lot of space. Um, otherwise, you just have a really large amount of clamps that that you have to deal with if you're doing the non go bar method. So, what led you to this acoustic guitar build in the first place? So, you were doing general woodworking, the homesteading projects, you were filming that, and everything. And then, what was sort of the genesis? of, hey, I think I want to build an acoustic guitar. So my son asked for a guitar for his birthday, and that was back in February. And I said, okay, you know, we'll get you a guitar, and we're going to get you some lessons to go with it. And he said, well, Dad, you're going to take lessons with me, right? I said, well, well, sure I will. <laughs> I've actually had a guitar for I, – I bought a guitar back in college, and I played it you know, here and there and it kind of got away from it while I was in school. Oh, so you, you play currently? Well, I'm learning to play. <laughs> uh, we're, we're actually learning to read music and, and, um, and to play. And so we've been taking lessons now for, 
I don't know, nine months or so. You, so you're going the sheet music route or you're learning guitar tabs? No, we are learning to read music. Sheet ah, music. wow. Okay. That's great. So we are um, progressing slowly. But uh, yeah, we, we probably can read about 100 songs now, which is pretty cool. And That's my great. son's doing really good with it. He, What kind of music he, are you guys doing? It's just a, um, I forget the name of the book, but it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a beginner uh, book and it's got a bunch of different songs and it's got some Christian music. It's got some rock. It's got, um, you know, just a little variety of everything. And, um, a lot of it's pretty simple, you know, um, but it's getting more complicated the, uh, the longer we take lessons and chord strumming, finger picking. We are doing um, a little bit of everything. We're not doing much finger pinking right now, but that is in the that's in the plan. Most everything right now is 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 actually, um, you know, picking with 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 the guitar pick and play a melody and and then also uh, chords and things like that. So almost every song you can play, you know, either by playing it with chords or you can play it. Um, play the melody as well so getting back to the the build itself so right now you've closed the sound box correct and you said you did a couple other things you some work on the neck blank or you're not on the neck blank yet yes i i had i i'm ready to uh, route the truss rod slot okay excellent. and i'm ready to start working on the fretboard and i'm trying to decide i'm I'm, I'm strongly considering building a jig for routing the the neck to shape. Um, I haven't decided yet. I have been researching it a little bit to see if it's something I want to do. I'm sorry. So to avoid neck carving, essentially, to route the contour of the back of the neck? To speed it up so yeah. I'd probably route the first through the tenth frets. So are you and then I, and then envisioning I would, yeah. a router sled? Is that the idea? Yes, that's right. Okay. And that would allow me to speed through that a little bit for future builds. Um, but it will still provide plenty of opportunity for hand shaping, you know, the, um, the transition areas. I think for this first build, you know, I'm just throwing this out there. I think you should, if you can attempt to go through the whole hand carving process, at least for this first one. And then you can see the points where like, okay, I can pre-route this right over here and I can pre-route this and then carve between. I think you're going to learn a lot through doing that process that's going to better inform how you can automate things in the future. Just, just my two cents on that. Well, I think I would have to do the first one that way anyways. Um, to build the jig, I think I would need to have a finished neck to use as a template to build a jig. And so I think this one's going to be probably done by hand anyways. And that would get me, that way I could design the jig um, to to mirror whatever neck shape that I come up with this time. So, What has been your biggest challenge so far? between, you know, getting the sound box together and doing the bracing and all that, and now what you're doing, getting ready for neck carving, what has just really either given you trouble or just been a difficult part of the process? I think we touched on it already, and really it's just a matter of um, having to go through the process of designing or building a jig for all these operations and then finding space to, to use them in, in my small space. I essentially, you know, build a jig, use it, put the jig in the corner somewhere, build another jig, use it, put it in the corner somewhere. Um, and it's a little bit slow on this, on this uh, guitar because I, I don't have the experience of building one. I don't have the, um, all the jigs already built. And also I didn't really know what I needed until I kind of came to that area. You know, as I progressed through the project, I kind of realized, well, I think this would make things a lot easier if I had this, like just yeah. for an example, the other day I was getting ready to cut the scarf joint on the neck. And 
I kind of went through the process of how do I want to do this? I've got a very small bandsaw. It wasn't an ideal bandsaw to cut the uh, scarf joint with. My table saw is more of a contractor style saw. It's not ideal for cutting it. I could have done it with a, uh, with a hand saw, but even doing that, I didn't feel confident that I could do it well. So I wound up building a jig for the uh, miter saw. And it actually worked pretty good, but it took me a full day to build the jig, you know. So what would you say as a percentage of your time you spend just researching, um, you know, setting, setting up, uh, changing out bits on your router, et cetera, building jigs compared to actual guitar making? And I think I know the answer already, but I want to <laughs> I want to hear you say it. it's at least 60, 40 or 80, 20 uh, research and uh, jig building and all that and prep work to actually okay. build the guitar. 60, 40. I'm, I'm actually uh, surprised by 80, 20 sounds more like a reflection of what I hear, you know, from others and my own early experience. I mean, the thing is, of course, once you have these things established that whole thing flips completely and it's, you know, 2080 or 1090. Well, that would be really nice. <laughs> you, you'll get there. It, it'll flip. Don't worry. I've got several family members and friends and who are already asking for me to build them a guitar. So I, I don't know. I'm going to be exhausted by the end of this one. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the problem. There's never any shortage of people who know what you do and then, are hoping to uh, <laughs> to get a guitar out of it. Well, I need some practice, so um, anyhow, we we'll, we're probably going to build more than one. Let's put it that way. There you go. That's great. Yeah, I think I think we talked about before. You you've already purchased some tone wood for some future builds. Uh, what did you get for those? I've got a set of cherry um, for the back and the sides. I've got a set of maple. For the back and sides, and then I've also got a set of walnut for the back and sides, and then I also purchased some soundboard material as well. As well, so that that should be fun. Those 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 were not nearly as costly as the Indian rosewood that I'm using for this project. Um, so I noticed that those are all domestic. Are those? Is that because they're sourced? Uh, did you mill them out yourself, or or get them locally from a friend? Uh, actually, I bought those from a Luther supplier in the United States, and I, I actually got those purposely because they're domestic. I, I think I'm interested in building with material from the from the United States if I can. And why is that? Uh, I mean, I guess it's just it just seems I don't know. I, just it's the idea of the trees being in the United States seems seems interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely pretty cool. I've got some cherry that we've cut down from a neighbor's house and we're going to start batching out some parts from that. So it, it hasn't been something I haven't personally gotten into that, the whole idea of locally sourced woods um, too much. I did a little bit early on. I built a, a cherry guitar. Now I think I'm, I'm starting to warm up to that idea again myself because lately I've just been ordering like what you're talking about the rosewood uh the zero coat all of these exotic woods that are really striking and also make excellent tone woods but it's just kind of cool to have something that you know was sourced at least within the north american continent but even cooler if it's even a little bit lo uh, closer to home like in your within your state or you know, your neighbor's backyard, for example. No, for sure. I've got a walnut tree that um, we milled a few years ago that has been drying. I've got it stacked and it's drying. And it's not uh, wide enough that I could probably build a full-size guitar, but I could probably build a ukulele out of it. If Is I that something to. you plan on doing? I would really like to. I would love to build something out of that tree because it, it literally was – you know, a hundred feet from my house and, and, a, and a storm brought it down and we uh, milled it up and had it, you know, cut, but there's not a ton of quarter sawn material in it because at the time I didn't, we just, we just slabbed it, you know, we didn't, we weren't, right. 
when we milled it, we were not focused on trying to get quarter sawn material. And but there is it, enough in it that I could probably get quite a bit of material out of it. And what did you use to mill it out? Uh, a wood miser or a chainsaw mill? Or I've got a friend, uh, Luke, if you're listening, hey. Uh, my friend Luke has a, uh, has a small bandsaw mill. And um, I took the, the logs to his house and we, and we milled them up. We, we milled a few things together. And, um, yeah, we got a lot of walnut out of that tree. It was two 12 foot long, uh, walnut logs. And that, that tree was probably, I would say it was 25 inches in diameter. Oh, wow. And for him to help me to mill it, he got half the tree and I got half the tree. So that's a good deal. Do you have any questions that you're going through right now with your guitar build? And why don't we go ahead and, and talk about some of those if you're you have any issues with the spot you're at right now as far as closing this or you just had the sound box closed. I did. I I need to at this I'm ready to route the I'm ready to go through and, and bring the, the back and the soundboard flush with the sides. And then I then I'm gonna have to go through and sand those sides. So I am one thing I I need to do or I'm considering doing is building a jig to help me hold the sound box firmly to the workbench for the operation of sanding the sides and also for uh, putting the purfling and binding on the guitar. And what I'm thinking about doing is taking my plans and building sort of a half model guitar out of, out of plywood that's hollow in the middle that the way the guitar can just sort of sit or the sound box can sit in that jig and hold it firm to my workbench. That way I can work these sides. My workbench is not designed. I mean, my, my, my client, my uh, woodworking vice is not big enough to hold the guitar. Yeah. And you and, wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to do that just because of the shape of the sound box. Right. Because of the, that doming, you really can't put pressure in the middle of the box because you can collapse the whole thing. So what you need is something that's going to grip only on the outside. So what I use, very simple, is just a a vise that I've made myself out of two two by fours that have a radius cut into each piece of the two by four. And it's an over radius to what I would ever use on a guitar. So the steepest radius I ever use on the sound box of a guitar is 12 feet. So that radius on the vice is cut to 10 feet. So it's a little bit more dramatic of a radius so that no matter what I put in there, it's going to, when I crank it down, it's going to only grip on the rims, which is the safe part. That's where it's supposed to be able to grip. And that works really well for, I have some really thick quarter inch cork on there. And so it just gotcha. grips, it grips really well uh, onto the edge and I use that for exactly what you're talking about, for holding it firmly in place while I'm sanding the sides. And uh, I also use it to install the end wedge. And there's, there's a couple other good uses for it, too. But, you know, you never def- consider definitely help you, you out with that. You would never consider that you need these things until you get to right. the point where you need it. Right. Right. I mean, I kind of knew that you, you can get by without you can get by without you can just hold it and sand it and, and it's fine. And. That's why I don't even mention that in the online course because, you know, you don't want to overwhelm. I don't want to overwhelm people with too many things because certainly for the first couple of years of building for myself, I didn't have half of these things. I did not have the radius vice that I just described. I would just kind of hold it with one hand sort of against my body while I sanded with the other hand. And it was fine. It's just a lot more comfortable and I save a lot of my energy now using that radius device. I bought a, um, a handheld spindle sander that mounts to my drill. Is it the the elevate Luthery spindle sander? It is. Yes. Yeah. That's fantastic. Now I haven't used it yet, but what I realized was I'm going to have two hands on that thing. I got to find a way to get that, get the sound box fixated to my workbench. Yes. Yeah, because I don't want to be, you know, I don't want that thing falling on the ground. Obviously, it's, I got a lot yeah. Of work for to do. that, if you have but, that, 
that's great that you told me that you have that um, because then you definitely do want to use some sort of vice like we're talking about here. You really do have to hold that down if you're using that. But uh, I also was thinking that it would be nice to have a jig to uh, put the purfling and the binding on with. And I think I could design something that I could use for both. You know, I think probably for 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 gluing on the binding and purfling, I could use some really strong rubber bands attached to the jig. And as you glue the, the that on there, you could strap it on there with the rubber bands. I mean, you would do one half of the sound box at a time, obviously. Um, yeah. But I think I could design something where I could do both of those things with the same jig. I, I think you could. I would, uh, again, I think you should go through the process with the tape first. A lot of builders that are, you know, well established and have been doing this for a while still use the tape. So I think really? that's some, something to think about. So that's just something to consider. I've never tried something like that myself. I can kind of imagine what you're going for there. And I can see how it, it might work. But um, I would just go through the process first. I have the tape. I, I have tape. And, and that very well may be what I do for the first one or, or for this one. Is it the Stumac um, binding tape? Yes, I, it is. The brown tape or the orange tape? It is the brown. Okay. It doesn't make much of a difference uh, between using one or the other. I was just curious which one which one you were using. One has a stronger backing to the tape and the other one. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I haven't even opened the package yet, but yeah, I do have the brown tape. So. Okay. All right. So, Jim... How can people find you if they're interested in checking out Lasting Build and, and watching some of your videos? Yeah, so my my uh, YouTube channel is Lasting Build. It's one word. You can also find me on Instagram at hashtag Lasting Build. And my email address is LastingBuild at gmail.com. Uh, I, we didn't mention it, but I'm, I'm filming the entire guitar build process and I'm posting it. Uh, in in different episodes. So I've got the first two episodes out currently on YouTube. And the first episode was just an introduction. And the second episode was building the the mold of the guitar. And then uh, the next episode will be uh, building the back of the guitar and all the bracing and everything. So it's not going to be in nearly as much detail as a course would be in, but it's a it's going to be a nice overview, I think, of the process, and I'll certainly share the places that I've made mistakes and and maybe how I could avoid them in the future, and and I'll be sharing, you know, some of the tools and jigs and all those types of things that I'm using throughout the process. So if you're if you're thinking about building an acoustic guitar for the first time, I think you would probably enjoy the series. Yeah, I think my uh, my students in particular and listeners and and the people who follow my youtube videos will actually get a lot out of that because like you mentioned some of the stuff that i do is very in-depth and very long form and so you don't get sort of a quick crash course view of it and so i think a lot of people just checking that out in order to see what the process looks like in total it's going to help them out a lot yeah i anticipate the entire build you know, start to finish, it'll be in multiple episodes, of course. I'm trying, I'm shooting for like eight to 10 minutes per episode, but it'll probably be a total of an hour when it's all finished. I'm shooting for somewhere around um, probably six to eight episodes, something like that. So hmm. we'll that see. Great. We'll see if, if I can make that happen. It's a lot of work to edit these videos because sometimes I have. Sometimes I have three or 400 video clips per video. I like to get multiple angles when I'm videoing a certain operation. I think it makes for a much more watchable video. And I like it. We didn't really talk about it, but when it comes to YouTube, I prefer more of a, almost like a cinematic movie format. The channels that I like the most are the ones who, who make basically like woodworking movies or mini movies and it's woodworking, almost like, woodworking porn. Uh, if that's what you want to call it, yeah, <laughs> you could call it that. Um, but you know, more of a cinematic type video where it really flows well. And 
you, you can almost picture yourself in their shop just watching what they're doing. And right. So I try to, I, I'm not a, I'm not a videographer by any means. Um, and, and everything I know about video and I learned on YouTube, but, um, I try to make it very watchable and, and entertaining as far as, you know, try to try to get some really good shots and angles and things like that. And then for this, this project, I'm doing some voiceover as well so that I can share some of those, you know, mistakes and all the things that I'm doing. And I think, I think there's some, it's a little bit complicated building a guitar, of course. So, you know, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and can I just tell you that uh, I've noticed in your more recent videos that the voiceover for me at least really works. Like I've, I've been enjoying it as opposed to, as opposed to the speaking directly to the camera approach. No, I appreciate that. It's something that is different for me in the past. I've, generally talk to the camera as I go and then I would complete an operation and then talk to the camera or even talk to the camera while I'm doing something. I may be sawing a board and talking at the same time. And that, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, this project is taking my full focus and I just don't, I feel like if I do that, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. So it's easier for me to focus on what I'm doing as, 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 as a guitar builder and, uh, you know, moving the camera around is not a huge deal. I can do that without it really distracting me too much. But I really wanted to be focused on what I'm doing. I didn't want to make more mistakes that I need to. And then I can go back and, and, and talk about what I'm doing in a voiceover format. And, and I can add in some nice music and things like that during transitions. And so that's right. kind of how I'm doing this series. All right, man. That sounds great. I'm sure people are going to check that out. And uh, thanks a lot for sitting down and having this conversation with me. And we'll be having another one in the future. So I'm sure we can complain about video editing <laughs> a whole lot there because I got lots to say about that for sure. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm yeah, looking sure forward thing. to this uh, podcast of yours. I I'm going to learn a lot from listening to it. Yeah, it's wow. going to be super fun. I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. I enjoyed this. So we'll have lots more conversations in the future. Great, great. All right. I'll talk to you later, Jim. All right. Thank Take you. care. See you. If you enjoyed this and you learned something here, please subscribe and leave a review on whatever platform that you are enjoying this on at the moment. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com. Or you can register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania. Bye for now. <laughs>